Fundamentals of Socialization by Karl Korsch. The word socialization was incorporated into common usage after the November Revolution. It appeared earlier sporadically. As far as I have been able to determine, it was first used in 1875 by the insipid, quote, universal philosopher Eugene During, who attained historical importance after Friedrich Engels, who tore him to shreds. But the particular meaning in which it has seized the consciousness of the masses is present neither enduring nor is it to be encountered in the writings of the non-revolutionary period. For during, socializations are, one, ideologically grounded world improvements, where others speak of socialization of the word, so, where others speak of socialization, the word either indicates, too, the historical process of development of an automatically self-constituting socialization, observed purely theoretically, or else something which lies much further from the current revolutionary concept of socialization, namely, the merely social reform type of progressive development of the modern state in the sense of those social-political ideals which are maintained and labeled, quote, socialism by Edward Bernstein and his followers. The conception of socialization which flourishes today in the minds of those revolutionary elements which are class-organized stands in radical opposition to all, these, all of these three notions, utopian world improvement, theoretical observation of history, social-political reforms. For these people, the concept of socialization first and above all means something essentially revolutionary. That is, if we care to grasp the idea in its formal universality and not yet in its individual substantial determinations, socialization is the social revolution. It is the socialistic concept in flesh and reality developed through practical human sensuous activity. Part of the conceptual structure of the Marxist worldview, which had been misperceived and misunderstood even by those who call themselves Marxist, has recently come into its own and resulted in the passing over of socialism from science into socialism as action, as revolution, as, quote, practical critical activity, end quote, as, quote, revolutionary praxis, end quote. Those who up until now have seen Marx and Engels' conception of historical materialism as a particular theory of historical knowledge which demands no practice must today, finally, comprehend that they have yet to grasp the essentials of scientific socialism in the specific sense laid down by Marx and Engels. In opposition to the materialistic knowledge of nature, for Marx, the material knowledge of societal development from the very beginning never consisted merely in a purely theoretical comprehension of an entirely of an entity under the form of an object or of an institution, but rather always simultaneously consisted in subjective, human sensuous, practico critical, and therefore revolutionary practice. Of course the organization of revolutionary elements as a class presupposes the, quote, mature existence of all the forces of production which can generally be engendered in the womb of the old society, end quote. And the approach of social revolution commences only when the stage is reached at which, quote, the already acquired forces of production in the current societal institutions can no longer coexist, end quote. But when this point has come, this stage has been reached, then of all the forces of production which break the chains of the old societal order, quote, the strongest force of production is the revolutionary class itself, end quote. When their time has come, the external conditions of the established order change themselves not from themselves, but rather solely through human practice. The contradiction between the further developing forces of production and the traditional relations of production, together with their superstructure, creates only the material preconditions for the solution of a, quote, task which is to be recognized as solvable and is solved solely through revolutionary praxis. The new scientific worldview first fulfills itself in this unification of theory and practice. In it, Marx's fiery soul has smelted together the act-shy knowledge of the old sciences of society and the knowledge-shy will to act of the old utopianism into the identity of objectifying knowledge and activity. Thus and only thus can it be understood that precisely... 
the most genuine Marxists, the most, quote, scientific socialists, were also those most strongly gripped by the practice concept of socialization in that historical moment when destroyed by its own antagonisms, the structure of the old capitalistic order collapses in turmoil. Only from this standpoint is it understandable why the word socialization for those immature times too unscientific and utopian totally lost its ideological overtones in the revolutionary epoch. Moreover, only so is it understandable why that version which sees the social revolution as a historical development affected by non-human forces and carried out by quasi-natural laws appears as an ideology far separated from reality in, the, in that moment in which socialization can only be grasped and understood and affected as a practical task. Having once recognized from the correctly understood standpoint of a theory of historical, quote, materialism, through the eyes of scientific socialism as a theoretical expression of the proletariat, that in a particular epoch of societal development and decisive transformation from a theoretical to a practical, critical, quote, revolutionary activity is unavoidable, necessary social, is unavoidably necessary socialistic theory and prophecy, quote, must show in practice, praxis, the truth, that is, the reality and power, the this-worldliness of its thought, end quote, Marx. But the following still remains to be investigated. To what extent and in which manner has the scientific socialism of our time done justice to this, its final and most important task? We ask, to what extent has the socialistic theory of those, quote, classes which are called to action, end quote, having first, quote, brought them to the consciousness of the conditions and the nature of their own actions, end quote, also managed to opportunely thrust into their hands the practical way to the completion of this action, that is, the, quote, forms in which, quote, socialism can become praxis and reality. In raising this question, we who are putting forth the claim of being the inheritors of Marx and Engels most, must feel great shame in our hearts. Those few who are truly revolutionary in their thought, who feel the coming necessity of action as a living reality, those who have stood up for the German proletariat after the departure of Marx and Engels must expend their best forces in the battle against the growing number of those who still mouth the memorized slogans of a radical idiom, but who themselves no longer carry in their hearts a full belief and a genuine revolutionary readiness to act. These same people con conducted inquisitions against those who no longer desired to pay a homage to such lip service, to mere slogans in the non-revolutionary interim of the time. Thus we have to explain the fact that a large number of still valuable remarks are to be found in the works of Marx and Engels, which are concerned with the transformation of socialism into practical reality, and therefore with socialization. But yet the entire later Marxian literature contributed nothing essential to the advancement of these practical problems until right up into the war years. Instead, throughout this entire period of increasingly noticeable stagnation, which grew out of unperceived beginnings, and which appears to us today as the epoch of the Second International, the majority of spokesmen of revolutionary socialism sought to guarantee the, quote, scientific character of the Marxian doctrine by rejecting from the beginning every attempted clarification of the following question as a relapse into pre-Marxian ideology and utopianism. How, on the basis of each economic and social psychological stage of development, can the socialistic demand, quote, socialization of the means of production, end quote, be practically realized? Consider, for example, the following sentences from Kautsky's comments on the fundamental components of the Erfurt program. Quote, Social democracy can make positive proposals only for today's society, not for the coming society. Excuse me. Consider, for example, the following sentences from Kautsky's comments on the fundamental components of the Erfurt program. Quote, Social democracy can make positive proposals only for today's society, <clears throat> not for the coming society. Proposals which surpass it can only reckon with contrived presuppositions instead of facts, and are therefore fantasies, dreams which even in the best cases remain ineffectual, if their author is talented and active enough to influence the intellects. 
then this effect can consist solely in error and waste of energy, end quote. These sentences of Kautsky are self-evident, viewed in and for themselves. They are thoroughly correct, and no one who has breathed into himself the essence of Marx's spirit would expect any light from such, quote, proposals alone. But in the past year of revolution, something entirely different from such arbitrarily fabricated proposals and projects towards the quick and complete solution of the social question was just given to us again in abundant fullness, namely the concepts of realization namely the concepts of realization, which arise out of a full knowledge of the economic and psychological totality and its, perceived, and its perceived tendencies of development. Through these concepts, the science anticipates the individual emerging social reality. Through their conscious anticipation of the future, these concepts also posit one of the realities through which the creative transformation from the old to the new forms of social and individual being alone can be accomplished. Scientific knowledge can, of course, take this particular form only in the creative fantasy of a revolutionary who has already previously carried out the transformation from the old to the new in his thought, and from the fact that Kautsky and all of these who stand close to him do not possess such creative, faithful, revolutionary fantasy, we can explain their all too long denial of the practical future oriented all too long denial of practical future oriented thoughts. From this lack of revolutionary fantasy, we may also explain the ghostliness of the programs of action and the plans for socialization, pale and genuinely sufficient for no one, least of all satisfactory to the driving masses, which these people still develop at various times before and after the November Revolution, which these people still developed at various times before and after the November Revolution, despite their doubt as to the usefulness of such action. But by and large, one can say in summary that right up into the war and revolutionary times, the socialistic thought of the preceding epoch rejected ever, every investigation into the forms of socialistic construction. Moreover, and in ever-increasing degree, the essentially unrevolutionary view set forth, quote, as if the transformation from capitalistic to socialistic society had to automatically execute itself, since the bed of the socialistic society had been so perfectly prepared by the development of capitalism that one needed only to modify the relations of ownership while the economic organization could be utilized for the new purposes without modification, end quote. Sorry, I don't have the footnotes in front of me. The footnotes are like at the end of the thing, so I can't tell you who said that quote or any of these quotes. The few who saw this condition of increasing passivity as dangerous and fatal stood mostly outside of the actual socialistic movement, and their views were therefore not able to become fruitful for socialism. Thus it is by no means to be traced back to the purely external coincidences that in the it is th thus it is by no means to be traced back to purely external coincidences that in the Enormously fateful months after November 1918, as the political power organizations of the bourgeoisie collapsed and nothing external stood in the way of the transition from capitalism to socialism, the great hour had nonetheless to slip by unseized because the social psychological presuppositions for its utilization were greatly lacking. A decisive belief in the immediate capacity for the realization of the socialistic economic system, which could have carried the masses onward, was nowhere to be found, nor was there a clear knowledge of the nature of the first steps to be carried out, of course. Also contributing to the problem was the total confusion which developed in the proletarian ranks. The proletariat had been wholly torn out of the normal life conditions of the industrial wage earners by the long war, and thus in the decisive moment could not at all be reorganized as a revolutionary class. Next to such basically external factors, and seen from today's revolutionary standpoint, the practically incomprehensible incompre backwardness of socialistic theory with regard to all problems of practical realization contributed decisively to the fact that the cry, the quote, cry for socialization, end quote, procla proclaimed loud and massively enough two or three times in the course of the year and taken, one second,
Sorry. Next to such basically external factors, and seen from today's revolutionary standpoint, the practically incomprehensible backwardness of socialistic theory with regard to all problems of practical realization contributed decisively to the fact that the, quote, cry for socialization, end quote, proclaimed loud and massively enough two or three times in the course of the year and taken in the camps of the bourgeois classes and their troops with fear and trembling actually brought forth no practical results. On the contrary, the year 1919 went into history as the year in which the German middle class constituted itself politically and economically as the ruling class after the last remains of pre-bourgeois government forms and after the liberation from the chains of the war economy. Landmarks of this development were the 11th of August 1919, when the new German constitution went into effect, and the 18th of August 1919, when Vissel's when ideas on, quote, planned economy, end quote, were finally abandoned, and the return to a free economy was also proclaimed in the, quote, Weimar decrees, end quote, for the sphere of export trade. This short review of the history of the concept of socialization in Germany from the birth to scientific socialism up to the beginning of the new revolutionary epoch, whose realization we hope for should irrefutably demonstrate the following. In order for the social revolution to move forward at the present point in time, the further conscious development and clarification of concepts of action toward the final realization of socialism attains an importance that increases daily, passing beyond a summons to action that was at first only formal, to substantively fulfilling the slogan of socialization. Next, next to this in importance remains the goals of the proletarian mass movement that are superficially directed towards the present, higher wages, better living conditions, increased rights within the capitalistic social organization, which are to be accompanied through the organization of land and head-working proletariat, which are to be accomplished through the organization of hand and head working proletariat as a revolutionary class. On the other hand, from the Marxian standpoint, it is just as clear that this substantive fulfillment of the concept of socialization cannot be attained through pure thought and the ideological will of talented, quote, social technicians, end quote. Rather, for this purpose, that combination of theoretical, historical, and practical, critical, and practice forming slash thought informed activity is required, whose example, not reached again even up to the present day, Marx gave us in all his works. If we approach the question of the forms of socialization with this attitude, then temporarily, ignoring less important details, we can f distinguish three complexes of economic. We can distinguish three complexes of economic historical realities out of which we can distill the outlines of such forms in historico-critical, practico-scientific, quote, Marxian observation. Moreover, we can also establish that within the extensive literature on socialization which has appeared since the November Revolution, or in part even since the war, each of these three reality complexes has found its own particular expression in the literature. These three main directions taken by the concept of socialization are to be successively discussed in detail in later essays so that in the emergent synthesis a total picture can be depicted of the transformation of the ruling economic order striven for by revolutionary socialism and communism, one more or less corresponding to today's states of consciousness and reality. For the present, it shall suffice to point out in a wholly general manner the three large groups of economic historical realities and the resulting plans of socialization. It is unavoidable that in such a generalized grouping the individually indicated projects will be presented as somewhat more one-sided than they actually are. The originators of these plans have also brought into view in varying degree the remaining realities which are open equally for all, besides the one reality complex to which they owe their decisive stimulation. Each of them has already conceived of his truth as the synthesis of various individual truths, but of course what is important here is obviously not the assessment of the merits of individuals, but rather solely the subject itself. 
we choose this manner of presentation and grouping, although it may not be adequate to the intentions of the originators of the different models of socialization, precisely because of our interest in this subject and the most complete and distinct depiction possible. <laughs> The German war economy constitutes the first group of economic historical realities out of which some of the most important publications of the literature on socialization have received decisive stimulation. The most important literary outcomes of these realities comprises the plans of socialization of Otto Neurath, Schumann and Cronold on the one hand, and the Wissel Mollendorf plan for planned economy on the other. Although no socialist or communist can e see even a partial fulfillment of his executions in any of the forms of state economic management or economic regulation of the sort which up until now have materialized in peace and in war, although Engels so pertinently fought and ironized the identification of socialization and nationalization, and although it is especially necessary today to stress again and again that state socialism is not socialism, just as the previous state capitalism is also not at all state socialism. In spite of all this, it remains undeniably true that the central government organization, superordinate to all the existing economic units, in which the followers of the concept of nationalization, for the most part, have solely in view when they speak of the state, is indispensable for every genuine socialistic demand in public economy. The next, and next to its military task, in the last war the German state had also above all a purely economic task in fulfilling economic demands in a situation requiring the most extensive utilization of all available forces of production. The German state had to secure, besides the increasing war needs in a state of increasingly felt lack of raw materials and labor power, the bare necessities of life of a large number of people, so that only thousands and not millions of its productive active citizens would perish because of hunger, exhaustion, and the concomitant diseases. And one must recognize that the wartime state, supported by an immense increase in gold certificates and a financial politics that piled up loan after loan, is capitalistically, quote, is a capitalistically, quote, unhealthy, end quote, way loan after loan in a capitalistically, quote, unhealthy, end quote, way, which even England attempted to avoid if possible, sought to disregard in truly marvelous ways the standpoint of a private enterprise economy, profitability, and hence past beyond the central standpoint of how every private capitalistic economy is guided, exactly as an unnatural economy, administrative economics, that is not calculated and decided by money economics. For the duration of the war, the consideration of social production possibilities and social consumer needs, and not profit as in a private economy, was the standpoint which was supposed to decide on whether and how, on the whether and how of the social production of goods as a completely socialized and thoroughly socialist economy would be ultimately represented. Thus it would be an, as unmarxist as possible if the practical socialists wanted to carelessly pass by the gigantic experiment of a centralized economic regulation in seeking the forms in which the transition from a capitalist profit economy to a social demand economy would be carried out. It is obvious that in no that it in no way it is obvious that in no way could there be a simple limitation Excuse me. It is obvious that in no way could there be a simple imitation of the bureaucratic measures and institutions of a war economy that is burdened with all the lacks of makeshift expe expedience. Rather, it is from the knowledge of its failures, mistakes, and half measures which occurred everywhere that one can learn the most. This consideration itself leads us to the second of today's three main groups of pre-socialistic forms of economic organization. Briefly stated, this group consists in the most recent development of the modern forms of private capitalistic economy. The view that capitalism not only negatively prepares the way for socialism in including its own collapse through the continued development and sharpening of its inner antagonisms, but also positively in already developing 
within its own womb the forms of transpersonal social economic organization, which is no longer overseeable and regulable for the individual economic subjects, belongs so much to the ABCs of Marxian theory that it need not be further taken up here. It might only be briefly mentioned which important publications of the present literature of socialization appear to me to have issued forth out of these realms of experience. This includes all the varied plans for socialization, which, in exact antithesis to all state socialistic and centralist tendencies of whatever form, thrust to the foreground the idea of economic self-government of autonomous associations. Above all, this includes Rattenau, who in his most recent writing has advocated with increasing decisiveness the conception of a, quote, autonomous economy, end quote. Here belong also a whole line of other plans of socialization composed by various authors, which we shall investigate later. Above all, the socialization program of the Austrian Social Democrats written by Otto Bauer, which is very important for the entire post-revolutionary socialization movement. The most important application of this, quote, principle of guilds, end quote, in a single economic area is represented by the Kohl Report of the official German Socialization Commission. A private capital economic self-government a private capital economic self-government was realized in practice by Ernst Abba in 1889 in the socialized Zeiswerk in Jena, which was carried out in a manner exemplary for those times. Its constitution is, of course, no longer adequate for today's requirements. Just as the normal economic self-administrative body is no more common in the large association of industrial trust than in the single autonomous business. The third and most important group of realities, out of which the general concept of socialization can obtain a more specific content and a more solid form, is to be met in those organizations which are already today constituted purely out of the proletariat, and which the German and especially the victorious Russian proletariat also created and is today still further building, in the pre-revolutionary class struggle and revolutionary final struggle, that is to say, the workers' professional groups, and especially in the revolutionary council organizations. It is a deplorable lack of the otherwise so excellent and instructive study of Hyman's, which unites a great number of impulses towards socialization into a shrewd synthesis, that its author in no way grasped the importance of the councils for the construction of a truly socialistic economy, according to Hyman, quote, the introduction of factory councils has conceptually nothing to do with socialization, end quote. Socialism needs factory councils, not because socialism is socialistic, but rather because Socialism is also democratic because socialism requires the participation of all its people and wants the best of everyone. But for Hyman, the people are to be to participate. But for Hyman, the people are to participate solely, quote, in all questions of working conditions, end quote. Though to be sure, they are also allowed to take, quote, a peek into the business procedures, end quote. But above and beyond this, there is, quote, no room, end quote. For them in Hyman's projected economic organization. Let us recall that in the Soviet Union there was already a united working together of the higher and lower councils, which in wide application has been successfully carried through and has reached a balanced equilibrium that is completely satisfactory between the most far-reaching autonomy and simultaneous strict articulation of all single economic bodies in a planned total administration. Thus, it is difficult to comprehend how the socialist Hyman can believe that a socialization in the sense of socialism, which is the total replacement of the capitalist, the capital economy. Thus, it is difficult to comprehend how the socialist Hyman can believe that a socialization in the sense of socialism, which is the total replacement of the capital economy based on unfree work through a, quote, planned societal regulation of production according to the needs of the totality as well as those of each individual, end quote. Engels can be achieved today except through the workers' councils. If, however, one looks more closely, one discovers by no means only one, but rather simultaneously two reasons for this strange position. First, 
Hyman lacks the Marxian concept of socialization as identity of the historical process of development and revolutionary human activity. Just as for other organization technicians, for Hyman, socialization is in the last analysis nothing more than a, quote, rational system of organizing measures, end quote. Secondly, Hyman also fails to overcome the mechanistic bourgeois ideology of the state. In place of a power organization that violently forces together into an artificial unity the multifarious social and individual interests that are variously divided, Hyman postulates that in the socialist community the state will, quote, wither away, end quote, and then infinitely more open system will hold things together in a stateless, quote, society. Hence for Hyman, quote, the state is still identical with the, quote, totality in which all special interests truly come to equilibrium, end quote. But on the basis of this conception, Hyman can naturally attain no understanding of the enduring conflict, which can in no way be entirely eliminated by a state-produced, quote, equilibrium, end quote, for even a fully socialized community. There must still exist a conflict between the particular interest of the individual producers and the universal interest of the general consumers, which are grouped together in productive units in united working groups. But how, but how for Hyman could such conflict be possible, since it, as totality, quote, the state holds the producing groups together with all other producing groups as consumers into a unified democratic total organization? I conclude that only after overcoming this last remnant of the formal democratic state ideology can the necessity of the workers' councils for the construction of a classless and stateless socialistic society be understood in its innermost essence. Translated by Roy Jameson and Douglas Kellner.